Well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, of course, welcome to the Helicopter Dirty Dozen. I am James Dangerfield of the Airworthiness. I'm an Airworthiness Inspector and I'm Fast Team Program Manager for the West Columbia, South Carolina District Office of FISDO. I have an AMP and an IA and I've been in helicopter uh, mechanic or inspector for most of my career. All righty, let's continue on. Again, I uh, appreciate Concord Battery doing a wonderful job with this event. This is a great way to get in safety information out to everyone and definitely wanna thank Chris with Concord Batteries. During this presentation, I'm gonna go over a few items, but I put this together and mirrored the, help, the regular dirty dozen that's written for fixed wings, but I did notice there was a lack of attention in human factors arena with rotary wing aircraft. And here are some of the, way, the, the ways we're gonna help you mitigate those issues. We're gonna illustrate human error, and we're gonna identify 12 causes of maintenance error, and we're gonna suggest ways to reduce that maintenance error. So I want you to know I couldn't find any good pictures of anyone ejecting out of a helicopter. So I had to use this fixed wing example. Human error is both universal and inevitable. This means that everyone will make a mistake sooner or later. In fact, the best people often make the worst mistakes. When learning of an aircraft accident caused by human error, it's common to think the person involved is somehow deficient in skill or character, while we on the other hand are well-meaning, motivated, experienced technicians. We just wouldn't do something that stupid. When we think in these terms, we discount the moral of the story and miss the lesson in it. This example um, I was using, let's see, I messed that one up. Uh, the example I'm using here is about the S-16. Um, this pilot, I want to ask you, who do you think this pilot is? And you can tell by the aircraft that it's not a poorly trained pilot. This is actually a Thunderbird pilot. And it looks like he's made an error and had to eject out of the airplane. Um, the pilot started the loop at about a thousand feet, a hundred feet lower than he should have. Before takeoff, the pilot set his altimeter to his home base field elevation, which was in Nellis Air Force Base. And his action was possibly the result of habit. The elevation of Mountain Home Air Force Base, the site of a flight demonstration, was about 1,100 feet higher than Nellis. Even though the mistake was slight, setting the wrong altimeter setting, the outcome was tragic, at least for the airplane that the uh, pilot did survive. And of course, I mentioned this earlier, does the Air Force select mediocre pilots um, for the Thunderbird demonstration team? No, not likely, they only choose the best. So take that point, you can be an expert and you can make mistakes. And I actually gave away the secret earlier. Maybe I did find a person ejecting from a helicopter modified by rotor floater. Okay, this is an April Fool's joke and this is not actually a real, this is a doctored uh, picture. Uh, just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. Okay, on the next slide, I'm gonna show a video and I, while you're watching it, I want you to think of what safety gear you would wear if you were to climb this um, iceberg. So here we go. C'est bon, c'est donc. Pour les gants. Non, non, non. If you cannot hear the sound, that's okay. Uh, the main part of this video is to watch the video. So. Hey.
Okay, I think everyone gets the uh, the lesson from that slide. So uh, always be prepared for the unexpected, no matter what you're doing, and always think about human factors when you do it. And so here I've got um, the dirty dozen. And of course, this is really technically the regular dirty dozen, but it applies to the helicopter dirty dozen. The dirty dozen is a poster series highlighting 12 preconditions for unsafe actions. In other words, factors that would influence people to make mistakes. The series of posters was developed by Gordon DuPont while working with Transport Canada. It's not meant to be a comprehensive list. And of course, you will see the posters as we go through the presentation. This is our main case study. And I wanna mention a couple of things real quick. This accident was chosen because it hit many of the dirty dozen human factors, but all of these organizations discussed are very professional that are trying to do good work in a safe manner. Uh, on July 28, 2010, at about 1.42 p.m., an Air Methods Corporation American Eurocopter, AS350 B3 medical helicopter, November 509 Alpha Mike, during a VFR flight under Part 91, descended rapidly and collided with terrain in Tucson, Arizona. The aircraft was substantially damaged and consumed by a post-impact fire. The pilot and two medical crew members were fatally injured. The repositioning flight was for engine coking maintenance, and it originated at the Morana Regional Airport in Tucson at about 1.32 p.m. And the intended destination was the Air Methods Base in Douglas, Arizona. Okay, here's what the, uh, the aircraft looked like before the crash. And here's what it looked like after the crash. Very devastating sight. External examination of the engine at the accident site revealed that the fuel inlet union was detached from the boss on the compressor case. The fuel supply line remained attached to the union and the hydromechanical unit or HMU via the adjusted valve. The intermediate gasket was located in the fuselage debris directly below the union. So the first one we'll cover in the Dirty Dozen is lack of communication. And on each one of these posters, I'm going to give you some safety nets. It's ways to prevent uh, the lack of communication from happening in this example. For example, it shows under safety nets, use log books, worksheets, communicate and remove doubt, discuss work to be done or what has to be completed. And of course, you're mentioned here, Shift turnover should not be written, but descriptive words, or, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Shift turnover should not only be written, but descriptive words should be used such as left, right, top, bottom, upper, and lower. Always discuss the work to be completed and never make any assumptions that people understand what's happening. Okay, we're still in this one case study, but we're gonna go ahead and start off with uh, the lack of communication between the FAA inspectors and the repair station. So back in 1953, the Civil Aeronautics Board, which was the early precursor for the FAA, um, used documents. And basically, as the FAA grew, we started using these documents called OPSPECs that an air carrier would request, which allowed them to do certain things. Um, this OPSPECs was sort of like a contract between the FAA and the organization. And so here's what happened. The FAA principal maintenance inspector stated he removed the work away from station authorization in 2008. In other words, the repair station wasn't supposed to do any heavy maintenance 
away from their home base or their home repair station. They could do quick maintenance like a light bulb or uh, replace a small component, but they weren't allowed to do heavy maintenance, okay? So there was an issue with the communication because when the NTSB or the National Transportation Safety Board interviewed the repair station owner, uh, he said he did not identify the change when signing the page of A004. And you're probably going to ask me, what does an op specs look like? Well, here's what it looks like. The red arrows uh, on the left side points to a table of contents within the op specs document. And then over to the right, there's a specific op specs called Delta 100. And, and in the notes, it says work to be performed at a place other than the repair station fixed location. And it does identify in this document when you're doing small things, it's okay. In this example, though, we're talking about uh, re repairing an engine. So you're talking about removing the engine, engine disassembly, and that would not be considered um, temporary or quick maintenance in my mind. Next up is complacency. Complacency is caused by a lack of sufficient stress. We hear stress is bad for our health. Too much unresolved stress certainly is. However, we need a moderate amount of stress for optimum performance. So complacency. So during this accident, when the investigation was done, there might have been complacency by the repair station. So the repair station was a turbo service center, helicopter services in Nevada. They provided levels one, two, and three maintenance service, parts and tools. The, when they were in the repair station, they would complete a work order, which would require a final inspection before the, the uh, aircraft or component was returned to service. But when they were in the field, they did not have to complete the work order package. They would just do an a and sign off in the field. Um, and that was allowed according to the repair station's manual at that time. But what this meant was, is no one inspected the mechanics work until it was completely reassembled. And there were parts that were covered up that the air methods mechanics were unable to look at. And I'll explain that to you here in a minute. There's actually uh, three mechanics involved. There's the repair station mechanic and there's two air methods mechanics all working on this aircraft. Lack of knowledge is the next dirty dozen we're going to cover. So we need to make sure with complacency, we need to make sure we have those safety nets in place, okay? Um, any kind of mistakes we make could kill someone. These are some recommendations to help prevent complacency. Of course, stay in shape, do some physical fitness, create challenges for yourself and train yourself to expect to find a fault, never sign for any work you didn't do. And also if you're working with a crew like that, even if you're not used to working with them, ask them to inspect your work. That never hurts, okay? Again, next up is the lack of knowledge. So it may seem that a lack of knowledge is about being inexperienced. However, the rational point of view is that aviation is incredibly complex. No one has all the answers and we all lack knowledge in certain tasks we're not familiar with us, or familiar with. Even experienced people need to refer to up-to-date manuals and ask questions. Here's the example of lack of knowledge. So the maintenance test pilot came out here to do the maintenance check flight on this aircraft after the maintenance was completed. And he went and performed a seven and a half minute, minute um, maintenance test flight. He did a droop check, a rate of climb check, a cruise power check, a flight limiter indicator check, a flame out check, and auto rotation. Now, uh, they were able to find this out because the aircraft has a computer that records how much time he flew. And they did recover that. So the actual required time when they went to the Turbo Mecca tech reps, they found out that it's a 30 to 45 minute flight that's required. And here are the items that are required to be checked. A hover flight, a max continuous power climb, a max takeoff power check, 
and a max continuous power level, flight level flight check. So as you can see by this, um, he may not have he may not have followed the maintenance manual or may have went by his best guess. The point here is, is always check the manual if you're not sure how to do something. That, that pertains to pilots and mechanics. Here's those safety no, uh, nets for lack of knowledge. Um, definitely stay current, read, read, read. Uh, make sure your manuals are up to date and ask a tech rep if you're not sure or ask someone who's more experienced than you that uses the manual exactly how the procedure is supposed to be done. Distraction is the next item we're gonna cover. Does anyone have a cell phone? You know, it's almost become a feature of our culture, whether we're driving, listening to a speaker or maintaining aircraft, in some cases it can be disastrous. For example, I had to mute my phones before this briefing started so they wouldn't go off and distract me from the task at hand of doing this briefing. So here's our case study on this particular um, uh, item for the Dirty Dozen. On September 16, 2017, at about 4.35 uh, p.m., a Bell 206 Lima-3 helicopter, November 213 Tango Victor, impacted terrain near Ancho, New Mexico. The pilot who was the sole occupant was fatally injured and the helicopter was destroyed. It was a flight which originated at about 3.54 p.m. from Roswell International Air Center Airport in Roswell, New Mexico, destined for Albuquerque International Sunport in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So as you can see by the slide, the pilot was on a cross country, the weather was beautiful. I mean, he had great visibility. But during the investigation, they noted that the last five minutes of the flight from the GPS, his altitude varied between 6,200 and 6,456 feet. And of course, as you can see here, the terrain was between 6,000 and 6,400 feet. And you see the impact point was at 6,330 feet. So let's find out what happened. So they went in and pulled the uh, pilot's phone. Of course, he did pass away from this accident, which is a sad story. But they pulled the phone up, and they realized that the accident occurred about the time this uh, pilot was making a phone call. And they reviewed the phone call records, and they determined at 4.12 p.m., he called a rental car agency. So they went and interviewed the rental car agency and employee, and she stated that she remembered the call well. She added that she couldn't tell he was in a helicopter but that he seemed busy or distracted. And as they were talking about a future rental and she was in mid sentence, the line was disconnected. So we can all take a guess what happened there. And here's the formula that I like to use. I don't really like to use it, but it's kind of a sad formula, but a helicopter plus a cell phone can equal a crash, which is kind of devastating. So based on the information, the pilot was likely using his cell phone during the low altitude flight and became distracted, which resulted in controlled flight into terrain. Now, one thing I will mention to you, um, a handheld cell phone is not designed for a pilot in an aircraft. One other consideration is most helicopters have three controls and a person should be operating these with their limbs. One is the collective with one hand. Another one is the cyclic in one hand. And the other is using their feet to operate the tail rotor pedals. So how can you operate a phone with all your arms and legs in use? Well, you can't safely, we know that. Okay, next up is gonna be the lack of teamwork. So let's go back real quick and hit those safety nets though. Uh, don't use cell phones, of course. Always finish the job or unfasten the connection. Mark the uncompleted work. Lock wire where possible or use torque seal. Double inspect by another or self. So these are just some good ways to mitigate those issues so you don't have them. Okay, next up is lack of teamwork. Um, lack of teamwork, let's, mechanics, we like to work alone. Sometimes we, we have to work alone. If you've got an AMP at a GA airport, 
um, you may not have the opportunity to have someone inspect your work uh, other than the pilot or possibly the aircraft owner. So we need to rely on our coworkers even more because aviation is becoming more and more complex. So lack of teamwork may have contributed to a maintenance process error. Sorry about the pause there. We're back to our original accident case. Um, so here's exactly what happened. Um, between July 24th and July 26th, the accident engine was disassembled first and the mechanics realized that they would need additional parts and tooling to complete the work. The accident engine was set aside and the second engine was disassembled and the fuel manifold replaced. As the air methods mechanics completed the work on the second engine, the HF Santa repair station technician replaced the fuel manifold on the accident engine. During the work on the accident engine, module three was disassembled, the fuel injection manifold replaced, the engine reassembled by the uh, HSN technician, including the fuel inlet union. The engine was reinstalled in the helicopter by air methods maintenance personnel. And the HSN technician inspected his own work as an HSN technician working away from its fixed location. He had the authority to do that. So here's my question to everyone. What would have happened if the repair station mechanic had asked the air methods mechanics to check his work before assembly? Well, this problem accident probably would not have happened. These are the as received accident parts are displayed in the upper view in figure one, okay? Um, figure one, of course, is in the top right-hand corner of the slide. The lower view shows a closer view of the area where the fuel line with the jet union is attached to the diffuser assembly with a copper gasket between. The components were intact, but reportedly found disconnected at the jet union to the diffuser connection. Note the bolts, screws, and nut hardware was not found at the accident site. These are examples of the components that were also received for comparison. These are brand new, of course, and the detail and picture displays the exemplars of the jet union and the associated attached hardware or attachment hardware. So we say this, uh, the next one we have, of course, we're going to give you those safety nets for lack of teamwork. Communicate, team tasks require a full team, reconfirm duties among members. Next, we're going to cover on the dirty dozen is fatigue, and it's a constant threat to all of us. So here are the three types of fatigue acute fatigue, chronic fatigue, and operational fatigue. The most important two are gonna be the chronic and the operational. The acute fatigue can be resolved with one, one night of sleep or one rest period, but these other two require a lot more days of recovery. So make sure you don't ever get into that process. One good way to find out if you're having problems is if your coworkers say that you're mumbling or you don't seem clear thinking, and of course, here are some symptoms that you can look at when other people have fatigue or you have fatigue yourself. And then also, this is kind of an example of how your body reacts if you've been fatigued in comparison to a blood alcohol level. So if you have been awake for 17 hours, it's similar to a blood alcohol concentration of 0.05%. If you've been awake for 24 hours, it's similar to being um, having the blood alcohol level of 0 0.10, which, can, which is above what's considered impaired in the US. So remember, that lack of sleep can really affect your performance. Now, this is another case study we're gonna cover towards the end of the presentation. But in this example, we had a mechanic and inspector who showed symptoms of being fatigued. Um, as you can see by the chart, the mechanic and the inspector both work from 12 o'clock in the afternoon until around 11 p.m. at night. 
And they were also scheduled to be off on the day when they actually worked. Um, you can see the shift they worked was completely off cycle from when they normally worked. Uh, they ended up working the early morning shift until the evening. And you can see how many hours of sleep they claimed. The mechanic said he had five, the inspector said around seven. So just remember this event when we get to this red A star you see up here, that's an air tour aircraft. The Marines did a study. They wanted to see if they could get around the circadian rhythms that your body has. So your body has a biological clock that sets by things such as when you go to sleep, when, the, when you're in sunlight, uh, it's affected by temperatures, and it also affects your body, such as your blood pressure, your heart rate, and your core body temperature. The Marines tried to do a study where they tried to change your circadian rhythms as they travel long distances. And of course, they were unable to make it work. The normal standard stuff works like going to sleep at the proper time in the time zone you're in, uh, staying outside during the daylight. So some safety nets, here are those safety nets. Look for symptoms in you and other people. Try not to do complex tasks at the bottom of your circadian rhythm and sleep and exercise regularly. The next item we're gonna cover in the helicopter dirty dozen is lack of resources. And lack of resources covers several areas, for example, Money, people, time, tools, and data. Money could equate to parts that are very expensive, okay? So lack of resources may have contributed to a maintenance process error. So that error could have been uh, prevented, and here's why. When the engine was disassembled, or let me say this, the accident engine was disassembled first, and then the mechanics realized, you know, this is all three of them, realized that they would need additional parts and tooling to complete the work. The accident engine was set aside. The second engine was disassembled and the fuel manifold replaced. As the air methods mechanics completed the work on the second engine, the HSN or repair station technician replaced the fuel manifold on the accident engine by himself. So the HSN technician inspected his own work which he had the ability to do. The air methods mechanics stated they did not specifically inspect the repair station technician's work, but they did inspect the engine after it was installed in the helicopter. And operating under part 135, they were not required to get an independent inspection of maintenance. And let's go back to that question you see on the bottom of the slide. What would have happened if they had the correct resources? Well, as you know, they may have all three worked together on both engines, and they would have been able to catch that mistake. And here are those safety nets that you can apply. Make sure you've got all the parts before you start aircraft or aircraft on ground or AOG. Order those parts ahead of time. Uh, get part sources and arrange for pool or loaning of tools or parts. And always make sure you maintain the standard. Next up on the dirty dozen is pressure. Now, one thing I'll mention to you is a certain amount of pressure is appropriate, but too much pressure can cause a technician to make a mistake. If there's a generic hazard in aviation maintenance, it would be pressure, it would be pressure to produce. Pressure to produce causes a drift to dangerous methods. And so most businesses are in business to make money and they're gonna pressure you to get the job done quickly. Um, some of that's understandable, but you have to make sure it never gets to be too excess or too excessive. So we're back to our original case study. And here's an interesting fact. Mechanics felt pressure after the first engine run-up after maintenance because the air method CEO was coming in for a visit. The Safford base was out of service, which meant no back of aircraft was available to use at Douglas. Okay, so the Air Methods Area Manager 
stated that there is some internal pressure on pilots and mechanics because they know if they're not getting enough flight volume per month, for example, 10 or less flights, then the base may be considered for closure. All the bases in the Southern Arizona area were doing good or okay though. Okay, and in continuation along with this one, with pressure, we're gonna talk about a V-22 Osprey. This is an old accident back in 1992. The Osprey was a new aircraft. Um, this is a, the court of inquiry. Notice the FAA does not investigate military aircraft accidents. It's investigated by the branch that owns the aircraft. And in this example, this may have been, uh, I'm gonna assume the Navy or the Marines. Um, court of inquiry said that the fluid leak into the right engine may be attributable to a maintenance error of installing an oil seal backwards on the torque meter shaft. But the report added that it could not be conclusively determined that the reverse oil seal caused the leak. Thus the possibility of other leaking seals or sources could not be ruled out. In addition, the report said grounding, ground testing with incorrectly installed seals did not show significant leakage, but a leak did occur on another V-22 with an incorrectly installed seal, according to a government witness. Maintenance error cannot be assigned with certainty, but it considered to be a probable cause factor. One member of the Court of Inquiry noted that the system used to conduct maintenance at Elgin lacked organization, defined responsibilities, and a formal reporting and documentation structure. They also mentioned there was an ineffective quality assurance of the oil seal installation, and that the actual maintenance manual did open up uh, confusion and that because the seal could, could be installed in either direction, they mentioned that it could have been a poor design of the oil seal for this aircraft, okay? This happened back, like I said, 1992. So here is a diagram of where the oil, uh, oil leak occurred. You can see the right engine is um, highlighted there or darkened. That's where the oil leaked into the engine and the engine failed. And of course, the final determination was, is the Boeing organization at Elgin Air Force Base from July 18th to July 20th was inappropriately downsized, inadequately supervised, and was too focused on the departure of both the team and the aircraft to ensure satisfactory completion of the maintenance requirements. What do you think contributed to the accident? Well, let's see. Short staff, lack of supervision, pressure to make it on time, didn't properly double check their work, and lack of knowledge about putting the seal in backwards. So here's those safety nets on pressure. There are cases where it's self-induced, so make sure this doesn't happen. All right, next up, we have lack of assertiveness. Mechanics as a group are not as assertive as we should be. We like to fix the, air, the uh, aircraft and lead the conflict toward the managers. We don't like having people in our face. Our culture is can do. And I agree, that's kind of what we, the way we think. Here's a chart about assertiveness. Now you're gonna see another chart here in a minute. And a lot, there's a lot of the same elements in that second chart. Um, you're going to notice over here on the left that you've got high and low performance. And on the, the bottom, you have low, passive, and aggressive on the right, okay? And then up on the top, you've got assertive, both parties' rights. So in this case, um, notice the range between a passive and aggressive is along the horizontal axis of the chart, and performance is along the vertical. So I just described that. Assertiveness resides on this continuum between the passive and aggressive. The one pole is passive. It is a place where the person considers other rights to be more important than their own. Someone operating at this pole is willing to compromise their standards and acquiesce to dangerous ideas like go check the battery door. That's something you should do. The other pole is the aggressive pole where the person considers their own rights to be more important than anyone else's. This is where the person is offended and becomes angry. Angry people, people nearly always regret their actions after they calm down. Neither pole is productive. The best place to be is in the center 
where you're considering other people's rights and your rights kind of in a medium and your performance should be high at the top, okay? Remember this chart, there's another one real similar. So lack of assertiveness, if it's, um, if it's not critical, record it in the journey logbook and only sign for what is serviceable, okay? Refuse to compromise your standards. We don't have journey logs in the US, the Canadians do. Uh, we do have a minimum equipment list and other ways to fly aircraft with inoperative equipment. The idea here would be to follow the company procedure for dispatching an aircraft that isn't perfect. Whatever the procedure is, as the bullet says, never refuse or refuse, I'm sorry, refuse to compromise your standards. Um, the pictures you see on the slide, the top right picture is the crash in Tenerife, Spain. It's a communication error accident, but one person had an understanding of what was going on, and that was the KLM flight engineer, okay? He was asking the captain, is he not clear then, or clear? After repeating his question, the captain answers emphatically, oh, yes. Well, the airplane wasn't clear, and you can see the disaster that happened. It's not the most assertive of statements, certainly not the cause of the accident, but who knows, had the captain been in the frame of mind to listen to the engineer and had the engineer been more confident that perhaps the accident would not have happened. The next item in the dirty dozen we're gonna cover for helicopters is stress. Now I used to think that stress was bad, but believe it or not, some stress is good. And let me cover some things here. So stress is a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing in that it motivates us to perform. Why do we do anything at all? We experience some kind of pressure to compel us to move. It can be pleasure or pain, but if it's stress of some kind, we hear that stress is bad, but a moderate amount of stress can help us to perform at our optimum level. This is an inverted U, and it's similar to the assertiveness chart. Notice that the level of stress is along the horizontal axis of the chart and performance is along the vertical axis. If stress is low, it causes boredom and complacency. If stress is at a high level, then it causes fixation and confusion. For maintenance folks, it's probably a matter of confusion. I'd hate to think that a maintenance person would become so stressed that the survival instinct would kick in and he would freeze like he was facing a bear. A moderate level of stress is appropriate. It causes a person to be prepared and ready to perform. A moderate level of stress may be a person supervising, giving the order to get busy. So here are some safety nets involving stress. Be aware of how stress can affect your work. Stop and look rationally at the problem. Determine a rational course of action and follow it. Take some time off or at least have a short break. You know, I've noticed that like when you're working on an aircraft and you're in an area where you're trying to tighten a nut or a bolt, and it's a very, very difficult area to work in, taking that break allows you to come back and probably put that nut or bolt right in with no problem. So always take a break. That'll help you with that stress too. Discuss it with someone and ask fellow workers to monitor your work and exercise your body. So another one of the helicopter dirty dozen is lack of awareness. Again, we're going to go back to our original case study, but lack of awareness or reduced situational awareness can be an indication of one or more of the other human factors issues in action, such as fatigue, distraction, or lack of communication. So here's an example of how lack of awareness can cause some serious damage. So these are some of the issues that happened with this original case study that we reviewed. Um, the DNTSB uh, discussed in their findings. Um, in the accident, pilot's uh, call to LifeCom, he reported that he had two plus 55 uh, hours of fuel. In other words, two hours and 55 minutes of fuel, which equates to a fuel load of 90% of the mission fuel that usually takes two hours. And the flight to Douglas would have taken 55 minutes. Therefore, the helicopter would have landed at Douglas with a mission fuel load of two hours. Review of the maintenance records 
show that on June 21st, 2010, the engine cycles had exceeded the inspection requirements outlined in an airworthiness directive uh, 2009-09-3. So the air weather news director was due at 600 hours or 500 cycles, whichever occurred first. At the time of the inspection, the engine had accrued 300 point, I'm sorry, 308.34 hours, but it had 515.28 cycles. The company identified the oversight and complied with the airworthiness directive. Of course, this happened before the accident. Another one on lack of awareness is, uh, so when Air, Air Methods gets a helicopter like this and they convert it into a hospital, uh, Air Medevac for a hospital, they basically you know, gut most of the interior. They put the litter on the left side of the aircraft where the pilot would normally be. And of course the, the patient's feet, I believe are right there beside the pilot. There's a plexiglass shield between the pilot and the patient. Um, but the aircraft in this particular example, when they modified the aircraft, they put the rotor RPM gauge um, down at the bottom left corner of your screen there. And you can see it at the very bottom. Now understand this is not where it should be in the original type certificate data sheet. And of course, when they went back in the records and looked, they could not find any documentation for the relocation of this instrument. And why is this instrument important? Because you need this instrument to be able to do an auto rotation and you can't do it if you can't see it. And believe me, when you're under that level of stress trying to auto rotate, you don't wanna to have to look down at a tiny little gauge at the bottom of the instrument panel to try to figure out uh, and doing a proper auto rotation. One thing I will mention on this accident is the, uh, he did perform the auto rotation, uh, auto rotation correctly from what I understand, but he landed near a, a concrete wall, which was the leftovers of, of a house, uh, maybe the foundation or the wall that was a part of the house. And the back tail boom contacted that wall. And of course it must have ruptured the fuel tank causing the fire that um, caused everyone to perish in that accident. Next up is lack of awareness. Okay, this is a completely different case study than we've covered. Um, this was a commercial pilot performing external load operations in the helicopter when one of the main rotor blades separated, not a position I want to be in, or I'm sure any of you want to be in either, but it resulted in a loss of control and collision with the terrain. The helicopter rolled downhill and the airframe sustained substantial damage, which is, you know, the great thing about these aircraft is they do roll when you get in an accident, which usually most people walk away from. When they inspected the blades, they noticed that four of the main rotor blades were fragmented into many pieces. And the fifth main rotor blade was found about 900 feet from the main wreckage and exhibited less damage than the others. Post-accident and examination, this rotor blade revealed that it had separated due to a fatigue crack that had initiated near the root end of the blade at the second most outboard bolt hole through the spar, skin, and doubler. Like I said in the beginning, this is a pilot who had an AMP. And you know, you, you probably know this, and most everybody knows this in helicopter aviation. If you're a pilot, you got an AMP, that is really helpful when you're out at remote bases. For example, you're in Alaska or you're out in some remote site and you have to do some, you know, minor maintenance on the aircraft. So he had obtained his AMP so he could perform these uh, torque event inspections. He added that the averaged about 200 torque events per hour, and he tried to comply with the AD as best as he could on work sites. On a typical job, though, he usually didn't perform the torque event inspection until he got home at night. Well, as you can see, that didn't pay off for this pilot, but he did survive the crash. Here's what those blades look like. And the NTSB determined the probable cause of this accident to be the pilots and mechanics, the pilot slash mechanics failure to properly perform the required inspections of the main rotor blades at the necessary intervals, which resulted in an in-flight separation of a main rotor blade due to the disbonding and fatigue cracking. Contributing to the accident was a lack of clear guidance in the helicopter maintenance inspection instructions which allowed for the possible misinterpretation by maintenance personnel of their intent. Hmm, interesting. 
So here's some safety nets on um, what we just covered. Think of what may occur in the event of an accident. Check to see if your work will conflict with an existing modification or repair and ask others to see if they see any problem with the work done. Okay, the final case study that we're gonna cover is norms. Um, norms, I, I like to think of this as tribal, um, tribal knowledge. We're all guilty of it, uh, but basically you're learning from a person and not a manual or a procedure, uh, which is what you should do. And in the context of the Dirty Dozen, um, a great example, of course, is our group has a better way to do this job than a published procedure. It could be considered tribal memory, unwritten rules enforced by the group, peer pressure, or habit. In the case that someone decide to reuse a castellated nut that was worn out and would not have come loose if they would have installed a cotter pin. Now, we did discuss this case study earlier when we were talking about fatigue. The inspector and the, the uh, mechanic both had odd schedules and had very little sleep. And we consider norms may have been in play. Improper use of a connection hardware began a chain reaction that led to a crash of an AS350 or a star on a sightseeing flight, the NTSB states. A series of maintenance errors were responsible for the December 7, 2011 crash of a Sundance helicopter's Eurocopter, in this case, American Eurocopter, or Airbus now, AS350B2 in the mountains east of Las Vegas, the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board said. The pilot and all four passengers on the twilight tour sightseeing flight were killed in the crash and the helicopter was destroyed. At an NTSB meeting convened to review the accident, Chairman Deborah Hurstman noted the research has shown the, the primary category of maintenance error is failing to carry out necessary actions. And just to let y'all know, um, the NTSB is the final determining authority of cause of accidents, um, but the FAA has about 5,000 inspectors and the NTSB probably has about 150 inspectors that can go out and do accident investigations. Um, so the FAA is always involved in these. Um, in this case, we're a party to the investigation and we actually assist the NTSB. So let's find out what happened. So this is an example of the part and what it should have looked like when they did the maintenance. Um, they did the maintenance and we're gonna ask that question. Did the organization reuse, because you see a self-locking castellated nut there with a cotter pin. Did they reuse the self-locking nuts regularly without checking the self-locking serviceability, or I refer to it as drag torque. Um, were norms in play? We may never know. And when we say norms, was the organization so used to reusing these nuts that they didn't give it a second thought when they did it? We don't, we may never know that. Let's go ahead and see what this item should have, what it should have looked like we see, but we wanna see what it looked like at the accident scene here in a few minutes. And of course the NTSB, I mentioned this earlier, uh, the improper use of a degraded self-locking nut, and also the post-maintenance inspections by the inspector. And let's also mention the pilot who flew the aircraft should have also looked at the work completed. Contributing factors were uh, the mechanics and the inspector's fatigue, lack of clearly delineated steps um, for the maintenance task and inspection. So this is the photo of what they found, and it's very disappointing because it cost these lives. Um, you can see the red arrows, point, arrows pointing to the, uh, the horn area where the uh, four and a half servo would be connected, okay? You can see that the, uh, when they did the accident investigation, they found this and they did not find the, uh, the, the, uh, the clevis attached. So they found the four and a half, main rotor servo control input rod in the wreckage disconnected from the input lever and its connection hardware was not found.
So here's what I'll say. Norms or tribal knowledge always work per the instructions or have the instructions changed. Be aware that norms don't make it right. We all know you don't reuse a castellated nut that doesn't have any drag torque left on it. And we also know we need to make sure we double check our work with that cotter pin. So these are the dirty dozen. It's a catchy title, but are there possible there are more than 12 human factor issues? I'm sure there are. But these are 12 that are meant to stimulate the human factors discussion. What about illness and emotional issues such as anger, pride, or fear? What about drug and alcohol abuse? These are all items you need to consider. Face reality. What you do can cause someone to die if you're not careful. Also, I'd like to mention the Charles Taylor Award. Most people don't know who Charles Taylor is. He built the first engine on the first powered aircraft that the Wright brothers flew. The automobile manufacturer said it couldn't be done, but he built an engine from scratch in six weeks. There's an award for that. Please let us know if you have over 50 years of aviation maintenance experience and get in touch with your local fast team manager. Here's my outro slide. Please contact me if you have any questions on this presentation. And again, I wanna thank the whole Concord Battery uh, group and team for putting on this wonderful presentation to help educate mechanics in the field. And we thank you for your hard work and service, keeping people safe in the skies. Thank you for your time.